1 p.m. on November 5, 2005, Wisconsin State and local police put in a phone call to Great Lakes Search and Rescue, requesting assistance at Avery Salvage Stockyard in searching for 25-year-old Teresa Halbach. Dog handler and owner Julie Kramer, her husband Bob, and canine Brutus responded to the call working with authorities from November 5th to November 9th, when sufficient evidence gave authorities reasons to call off further need for search efforts. On February 3rd, 2007, two years after the search at the beginning of the trial, I received a phone call from Julie Kramer. Brutus was now 10 years old, and while still fit for duty, the start of the trial, which would capture the attention of the state and the nation, seemed to be a good time to reflect on his long life and successful career. Brutus was getting into his golden years, and health issues were now forcing the legendary dog into retirement. Despite the efforts of many professional photographers, Brutus's high energy and exuberance that he brought to the job was always caught on film. But that's not who he is at home, said Julie. It's great in the field, but at home he's calm. After 10 years as a human remains search dog, after working 150 cases and thousands of hours in the field, Brutus was humanely euthanized on December 9, 2009. The value of life is not in its duration, but its donation. You are not important because of how long you live. You are important because of how effective you live. Miles Monroe The art of entrepreneurship and the science of customer development is not just getting out of the building and listening to prospective customers, it's understanding who to listen to and why. Steve Blank His eyes are like the most beautiful thing on the planet. They were like a molten gold type. Those were what I liked most about his like features, was just his eyes. I found out afterwards that the meaning of Jasper actually means calming, earthy. Um, it's meant to like bring peace. And I didn't know that when I named him that. I just named him after a Twilight character. <laughs> to be a great portrait artist, you need to be able to get to the soul of a commission. To sometimes literally resurrect the dead and reunite them with a still grieving heart. Your product is your art. Your gift is one of healing. It is a delicate dance that involves expert skills in listening to your client, concentrating on the issues that they bring up, topics, physical features, and memories. Listen to all the stories and be there for the tears. You must listen without bias, without judgment. You listen through the laughter and you listen to the tears. But listen to the silence when it comes, for it means something as well. You must be gentle, you must be kind, you must listen with an unconditional heart. These stories need to be told. These are memories that they need to preserve. This arrangement of time, patterns, activities, the look, the smells, the anticipation, and the acceptance. They are all moments where your client had to choose, and that choice led on a journey, good or bad, that eventually was so poignant that grieving is sometimes not enough. Pay attention to the specific language they use. Two cars hitting each other is much different from two cars smashing into each other and can change the tone of the narrative. In this way, it can also affect how you choose your layout or the color palette that you choose. To put it in artistic terms, is the car cherry red or is it maroon? Is the truck sky blue or is it navy blue? Now that you have a visual the importance of the language, we'll move on. I would move down to Kentucky. Things were getting really crazy at home, and I decided that it was time to move down to meet my real dad, who I'd never met before. I had never known him. I was alive for 17 years, never met him once. And I moved down with him, and 
it was a farm in Kentucky, it had 15 chihuahuas, mm -hmm. <laughs> and there was one outside cat named Speedy, yeah. but he didn't want another dog. And I was like, well, how would you feel if I got a cat? My dad wakes me up for school one day and he's like, Cheyenne, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what's the question? And he's just like, so you say you want a cat, are you willing to get a cat with a little bit of work involved? I was like, what do you mean by work? And he was just like, well, you know how Dan had kittens? I was like, yeah. He was like, the mom got hit by a car and these kittens are still weaning. They're not done bottle feeding yet. Yeah. And I was just like, well, let me take a look at them. So I went there, we all went there together. And it was Jasper and his sister, they were the only two left. Mm -hmm. And the other ones had either died or been rehomed. Okay. And Jasper's sister was a lighter color than he was, more frosty. Yeah. I went to go pick her up because I thought she was pretty. <laughs> she hissed at me. <laughs> I, was, I, I looked at her, I'm like, I don't want you. Like, that's literally my reaction to it. And I went to go pick up Jasper, and as soon as I picked him up, he started purring. Yeah. And I just looked at him, and I picked him up, and I was like, I was going to name him Kunta Kid Day at first. I wasn't even going to name him Jasper. And I was like, are you Kunta? Like, <laughs> so I was like, yeah, you're Kunta. <laughs> and I took him home bottle fed him for the first like four weeks of having him. I bottle fed him every four hours. I was only supposed to bottle feed him four times a day. Yeah. But I wanted a chunky cat. <laughs> I didn't want him to be skinny. I didn't want to feel like I wasn't doing my job. Yeah. So I bottle fed the little fucker every four hours. <laughs> my dad is sitting there like, you're buying the nurse all. I'm not going to complain about it. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, all right. And I brought him in the room, propped him up on the pillow. First thing he did, I was just sitting because I was on a bunk bed. I propped up on my pillow, I was just looking at him like this. And he reaches out and scratches me in the eye. And my whole eye swells up. Like my whole eye. And I just, I was so mad. <laughs> I'm saving your life and you scratch my face. <laughs> to better understand why your client may tell you about certain topics regarding your subject and your role as a grief counselor to your client, you must understand how the human memory works. In theory, the human memory works in two ways, recognition and recall. Recognition is the association of a physical object with an object or event previously experienced or encountered. Example would be a cat collar with that specific cat. By your client shuffling through pictures with you as an artist, they automatically trigger memories associated with those images. The way the brain works automatically takes them effortlessly to the moment in time. In this way, you are going to typically be told about physical features before events, using the concept of facial recognition. Since one of the first things that happens in a consultation, the passing of photos, you usually hear about the physical attributes first and the events of that pet's life second. Recall involves remembering a fact, event, or an object that is not currently physically present, which is why stories of the deceased can be so overly emotional for clients who are grieving. Recall involves actively reconstructing the information and requires the activation of all the neurons involved in the memory in question, whereas recognition only requires a relatively simple decision as to whether one thing among others has been encountered before. In the same way, emotional material is remembered more reliably in moods that match the emotional content of these memories. An example would be a happy person remembering happy memories and sad people remembering sad memories. Thereby, in listening to the narrative that your client gives, you need to pick and choose based on how and what they tell you to be the focus points. Ask more and more questions about positive experiences with the deceased. Create a repetitive dialogue asking about daily routines, playtimes, and happy moments or memories. While needing to take note of the tragic end, do not revisit it. Death is not anything any of us can prevent. Focusing on it usually brings negative emotions. If the client needs to rehash it, it may be due to an ongoing guilt or anger issue that needs to subconsciously get worked out.
Be compassionate and listen. Focus your inquiries on the positive and let the negative slip into the ether. In doing this, you are reinforcing the positive memories and letting go of self-destructive negative patterns and guilt which may be associated with the death of the pet. By doing this, you are now creating a new hierarchical path in their thought processes that associates your artwork, a physical object, with the happiest memories of their beloved pet, which through storytelling have now been reinforced. The events and memories that were locked into recall using emotional stimuli to access them will now be overridden with easier access. Please be very careful in doing this technique, though, as obliterating the death of a pet from the narrative can cause psychogenetic amnesia, which may result in permanent change in the client's memory, and the client may not be able to recall the circumstances surrounding the pet's death in the future, which may be important. I talked to you, you had mentioned he was a service animal. Yep. So did you have him registered then? Yeah, in Kentucky. Um, I, I'd gotten diagnosed. With, I, I didn't even choose to do things with that person. Okay. I had gotten drunk the first time ever getting drunk. And I woke up not clothed. And Oops. three months later I was diagnosed. And I was, like, as soon as I found out I just wanted it over. Like, I didn't want to deal with any of it anymore. I was like, I'm done. My whole life has been hell so far. I just, mm -hmm. I don't want any of it. I wasn't thinking of it that way. Like, mm -hmm. I really wasn't. I just thought that at that point, I'd never find anyone anymore. Mm -hmm. No one would want to, like, my family was going to look down on me. Yeah. Like, everything I thought was over. <clears throat> it was like a two-month prescription bottle, and I downed every single pill. And I did it in the middle of the night. It was like 3 a.m. No one was awake. And I didn't want anyone to be awake. I didn't want to get. I didn't want help. Jasper, I guess, didn't catch up on that. So he went and ran up and down the hallway over and over and over again. And he'd jump on my dad's chest, like pounce on him. And then he'd scratch his face. And then Jasper started doing it to me. He started running to me, pouncing on me, scratching my face. Except he was doing it a lot harder. And he actually broke skin, and my dad started realizing that, hey, her face is bleeding she's not waking up. Mm -hmm. So he calls the ambulance and if they would have gotten there like 20 minutes later I wouldn't be alive. And as soon as I got out of the hospital my, my therapist had asked how he knew how to go check on me and he told me and her, her cat woke me up. Yeah. And we both just looked at him I'm like what? And he's like Jasper woke me up. It's almost like he said you saved my life so now I'm saving you. This is part one of three of Jasper's story. If you'd like to hear the rest of the story or more on the consultation process with your clients, please feel free to like and subscribe to this channel. If you have any questions on your consultations, please feel free to leave them in the comments below and hit the notification bell to be the first to hear when the next part of Jasper's story gets published. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Morning Hawk Creations.